and welcome to this week's edition of The World Around Us. First, a happy, sad story from Rwanda. Then, a remarkable story about art and enterprise from Zimbabwe. On then to Vietnam and a look at the slow healing of the scars of war. Then, a story from Ethiopia on the Omo Valley. And finally, to France and a look at what's happening to old cars. A few years ago, before satellite television brought its terrible genocide into our living rooms, most Indians would not have known where Rwanda was. Now, anyone who glances even briefly at international news bulletins will know that this African country has been torn apart by its murderous ethnic divisions. Well, here is the story of one young boy that is both sad and happy. Twagirimana has been packed since four in the morning. The first sign that this fragile little boy is excited or perhaps scared. Only his eyes reflect the terror of what he has witnessed during Rwanda's genocide. Like more than 100,000 children in Rwanda, Twagirimana spent most of the 100 days of the genocide alone. During the war, I saw a lot of dead bodies. I saw a soldier shoot someone. I saw a lot of guns. When the fighting started two years ago, it was the last this 12-year-old saw of his family. At the end of the war, Twagirimana was taken in by Anastas Mabanjanda. I decided to take him in because I said to myself, no one is going to look after him, so maybe I should take care of him. He can become one of my own children. Now he's about to lose the only security he's had for two years. A month ago, he heard from these Save the Children workers that his mother was alive. Today, they have come to take him home. The aid workers take two photographs. One for the boy, the other for Anastas. It will soon be the only way these two can see one another. There's still one more goodbye. The only school and classmates that Twagirimana has ever known. Twagirimana's story is anything but unusual. Groups like the Red Cross and Save the Children have been trying desperately to help children like Twagirimana find their families. But there are still nearly 50,000 children far from their parents. Twagirimana has been one of these unfortunate statistics until now. Twagirimana's mother lives only an hour away, but it took them more than a year to reunite the two. <laughs> a smile for a bittersweet reunion. Twagirimana only recognizes a few of the faces. His father and five brothers and sisters aren't here. They're probably dead. His uncle has brewed special sorghum beer and carved new glasses to mark the occasion. <laughs> Twagirimana's mother, Vestin, and many of her neighbors lost most of their families during the genocide. The last time I saw him, he was still young. He seemed sad, and I don't know why. The return of Twagirimana is a sign of some hope. For the first time since the war, someone has come back. Now they have a reason to sing and dance. High emotion in a country where the people have learned to hide their feelings. This is Sarah Carter reporting. And now to a village in Zimbabwe whose population discovered in the most extraordinary way that they were all sculptors. Not small time, any old sculptors either, but sculptors whose works sell in galleries in New York and London. But let's take a look at how these ordinary farmers, masons and artisans discovered their hidden talents. In the 
My name is Kakome Kweli. I'm 87 years old. I started my life over by coming here to Teganenge. That was three years ago. I had come for my brother's funeral and I never left. I saw people making sculptures. I wanted to do what they were doing. I knew nothing about it, and then I tried. I had worked hard my whole life. They ordered me around, do this, do that, hurry up. That is all finished. My only bosses now are my tools, but they must wait until I am ready to work. Kakoma is the eldest of the sculptors of Tanganenga, a village in northern Zimbabwe. Twenty years ago, they were masons, artisans, and farmers. Today, they are all sculptors, whose work is sold in galleries in New York and London. It all started with tobacco farmer Tom Bloomfield. In 1965, Zimbabwe, then called Rhodesia, instituted apartheid. The international community responded with a blockade that financially ruined Tom Bloomfield and other farmers. When the United Nations sanctions came here, I had many, many people who were going to be out of work. I'd always had a dream to give these people a more creative life than being just tobacco reapers. I could invite my farm workers to become artists. And there we started with a few pieces of stone using old farm implements and sitting down under the trees making sculptures. I lived for 16 years in Tengenengi. I had no idea that we had right, this treasure right in this mountain, this huge mountain right next to us, was this wonderful serpentine, which in fact, in texture and in color, different hardnesses, is ideal serpentine material. It was a miracle. The whole idea of, of Tengenengi was that people should teach themselves and discover their own talents. Uh, I had no idea to, to teach them or to tell them what to do. Everybody used their own ideas without copying each other, but just to unfold his own creative feelings, from his dreams and from his culture. I learned to sculpt by watching the others, and then I let my imagination go to work. I never copied anyone, never. Perhaps that is why my work has been noticed, because it doesn't look like anything else because all my ideas come from my head and my past. What I often sculpt is what I saw in my youth in Angola. During the initiation rites of boys, dancers used these masks. It was said that their eyes rolled back into their heads to see what man does not know how to look at. Bernard Matamera's sculptures are sold all over the world. But he would never think of leaving his village or his quarry of serpentine stone. Artists who live far from here read too many books. They see too many images, so they lose their imagination in the images of all those books. Me, I'm very lucky not to have seen all of that. It makes me use my own ideas. They come to me in my dreams. Sometimes the spirits of my ancestors send me messages. I sculpted this bird woman because of a dream. I had dreamed of a woman who was eating the flesh of her totem, a bird. I saw her metamorphose, and I sculpted it that way. Alice Sani was Tom Bloomfield's cook when she first came to the village. In the beginning, I watched the greatest of sculptors, Bernard Matamera, but he never taught me anything whatsoever. He never critiqued me. I spent three months watching him work, following his every gesture. What he could do with stone fascinated me. Sometimes I try to sculpt spirits. I like the spirit of the elephant man a lot because it is the biggest of spirits, the strongest. Sometimes I sculpt people I knew in Mozambique, where I'm from. There I saw a lot of women die of hunger. I never forgot them. You can never forget that. Alice has made enough money to buy herself some cows and goats, a fortune here. Kakoma has, for the first time in his life, deposited money in the bank. Bernard has had three houses built, 
two for his wives, one for his children. Tom, more of an artist than a businessman, has never made a fortune, but he is proud of his former workers. I never dreamt that the talent of these people would be so great as that they should be represented in major museums. Also that, uh, that many of them would travel to exhibitions overseas and that Tenganangi should be so well known throughout the world. Kakoma, Alice and Bernard never read what the museum catalogs say. They are content to dream and then chisel those dreams into stone. The scars of war, especially the kind of war that nearly destroyed Vietnam, take years to heal. But now, two decades since the war ended, there are signs of wounds beginning to heal and people recovering from the ravages of battle. But not everyone or everything has survived, as we see in our next report from the Ho Chi Minh Trail. It's been more than 20 years since the war in Vietnam ended. And slowly, the Ho Chi Minh Trail is becoming a place of beauty again. Before the war, cinnamon bark was the region's biggest export. Most of the trees burned in the bombing, and although new saplings have been planted, it will be at least another 15 years before they can be harvested. In the meantime, local people gather as much wild cinnamon as they can find. The Ho Chi Minh Trail has made it easier to get cinnamon and other local crops to market, and that has helped create 1,000 new jobs for laborers. But the work is not easy, and it doesn't pay well. Some survive by cutting reeds used to make brooms. Others collect rattan. Their pay is determined by how much they can carry on their shoulders, so only the strong can work. Others fish. Because of the war, fishermen no longer need to use lines or nets. These fish, we fish them thanks to explosives that we recovered from unexploded American bombs. That gives us a good catch. We didn't like the bombs when we were under them. That made a horrible mess. But we can reuse those that didn't explode. The bad side is that it is dangerous. The government has banned the practice and tried to find all the unexploded bombs and mines that remain. But accidents are common. Every mountain village has had at least seven maimings since the end of the war. I was looking for wood when a mine exploded. I fainted. My friends took me to the hospital. I'm scared when I work the earth, but if I don't work, I have nothing to eat. Others make their living by recovering metal from abandoned military equipment. The blacksmith has become the most important artisan of the village. Thanks to him, bombs and shells are recycled into agricultural tools. A sickle made with American steel costs a little more than a day's salary. I don't know if the government would have been able to furnish me with such good quality steel if there had not been the war. Their death machine engines have a very tempered steel. And I have to admit, there is bomb debris just about everywhere. It is from this that I profit. The real money to be made along the trail is from gold. Most people who come here looking for it make only modest discoveries, but some have become rich by local standards. In the last three days, Tran Vap Phuc found $160 worth of gold, more than half the average annual salary. Before I was searching for sandalwood in the forest, first in Dom Nai and Lan Ken, then I came here. But after five years, there wasn't much sandalwood. I learned that you could find gold dust and that you could live off of it. So I set up shop. Money comes in more easily, and it's because of this that I'm still here. The trail has allowed local people to get roots and herbs that grow in the region to market in distant cities. 
At Da Nang, the hospital treats its patients with natural products made from 300 different plants found along the trail. But not even these plants can heal the ravages of dioxin on the human body. Handicapped children are still being born in Vietnam. I lived in Tra My. It is a place where the American planes bombed a lot and dropped a lot of chemicals. The rice had become completely black, same with the potatoes. When we ate them, they had a strange taste, but since we were hungry, we didn't have a choice. I didn't feel good when I ate those vegetables. I was sure that I would be sick later on. When my child was born like this, I knew why it happened. Tudu Hospital in Ho Chi Minh City has the second largest maternity ward in the country. All babies with birth defects are sent here. Most of them come from areas near the Ho Chi Minh Trail, where more than 5% of pregnant women have abnormal pregnancies. Doctors do what they can for the deformed infants. Children who live along the trail are getting new opportunities. Thanks to easier travel, they are able to go to school in a nearby city. The best students will finish their education on the coast, hundreds of miles away. But their sense of civic duty compels them to return home when they are finished. After medical school, I will return to my native village. There, the population is suffering a lot because of illnesses. They need me. I will return to serve. At last, the scars of war are beginning to heal. Now for a look at the strange and ancient ways of the Kara tribe in Ethiopia's Omo Valley. Life in the parched land of eastern Africa is fragile. The Kara tribe lives, as it always has, on the banks of the Omo River. It is the life force of the region. We cultivate the land by the river banks. The other land is too dry. During the rainy season, the river rises. It is rich with mud, so the river is very fertile. But if it doesn't rain once or twice a year, it's catastrophic. The sorghum rots and famine sets in. Sorghum is a staple of the diet here. The Kara eat it day after day and never get tired of it. Grinding the sorghum day after day is no problem. What is dreadful is to wonder every single day whether there will be any sorghum tomorrow. Can we wait until the next harvest? The rest of the food the tribe eats has to be purchased at the market in Damaka, a two-day walk from the village. Heat makes the journey dangerous, so fellow travelers are always welcomed. <laughs> Shepherds cut the neck of an ox and give travelers a drink of its blood. This, they believe, will give them the strength to finish their journey. At the market, spices, salt, tobacco, and coffee are plentiful. It's also a market of sorts for brides. Rich families from Kenya, the Sudan, and other parts of Ethiopia send envoys here to pick out brides for their sons. Damaka is known as the home of Africa's most beautiful women. When a tribesman returns home to the Omo Valley from the market, the women and the men are made up and waiting for him. The return of a traveler is reason to celebrate, with dancing that will last well into the night. Tomorrow, 
the sun will rise again on the Omo Valley. It will be hot and food will be scarce, but the ancient Kara tribe will find a way to eat and to enjoy life as their ancestors have, scientists believe, for millions of years. Finally to France, where used cars are no longer treated as junk. In fact, everything about them is now being used in a spontaneous spare parts market, which so far remains in what can be described as the unorganized sector. Two million cars end up in the junkyards in France every year. Here, weekend mechanics shop for the parts they need to keep their cars running. At the moment, I'm taking out the interior carpet. Not an easy task. Once I've done that, I'm going to take out the insides of the trunk, and then I think that will be all. You pay less here than at the store because you take apart your own parts. The labor is your own. In the face of a stagnating economy, more and more drivers in France are fixing up their old cars instead of buying new ones. That's created a growing market for used car parts. Junk cars are stripped of every reusable piece. After that, the car's metal frame is melted down and recycled. One third of French steel is produced with iron from old cars. Traditionally, that's as far as recycling of cars went. The rest of the car was thrown away. 400,000 tons of leftover car parts end up in France's landfills each year. But all that is changing. New standards have prompted engineers and builders to look for different ways to recycle car parts. Outside Lyon, Peugeot and Citroën have joined forces to find a way to transform tires into fuel. Shredded tires have a very big calorific value, two times the calorific power of coal. Tires are a limitless resource. At the moment in France, there are 330 million tons of discarded tires. It is a fuel that will replace fossil fuels. It is an inexhaustible resource, an incredible fortune for the person who knows how to exploit it, of course. Other recycling efforts are less ambitious, but still important. Every year, two million car batteries are abandoned in landfills. The lead is disastrous to the environment, but because of the rising price of the metal, profitable to recycle. Already half of all new car batteries in France are made from old ones. Ironically, the biggest problem facing recyclers of auto parts is the very thing that makes cars so efficient, plastic. To improve fuel economy, manufacturers now use four times the amount of plastic they did 20 years ago. Some plastics, like those used to make bumpers, can be ground up in factories like this one near the Luxembourg border. Lots of industries that have problems with plastic waste come to us saying, could you develop for us this or that application with this or that waste? And so we develop, we research, and I can tell you that a day doesn't go by when we don't get a request like this. Car manufacturers are researching how new cars can be built so that they'll be easier to take apart when they're old. Limiting the types of plastic used in cars is one way. Another is to imprint on the recyclable parts information about the composition of the material. Here you have all of the recyclable parts. The idea is to show which materials they are composed of and then to diagram the car using a color code to show these parts. We will then be better able to sort the parts. Fewer old car parts are ending up in landfills in France. The car of tomorrow is often being designed today using yesterday's recycled car. That's all this week. Do join us next week, same time, same place, for another look at the world around us.